paid the debt and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life had brought me to God with him to be. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer with his blood. He purchased me on the cross. He sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free, and made me free. Aren't you glad for our Redeemer? fitting song for tonight as we're going to be looking at what does the Bible have to say about radical environmentalism and a lot of it's got to do with our redemption. Uh, so we'll see that as we go through tonight. So what a blessing it is to see you. Appreciate uh, each of you being here. Uh, if you didn't get enough to eat, it's your own fault. Uh, <laughs> we had a good time fellowship over there. It's a good crowd. Uh, appreciate uh, each and every one of you uh, coming out for that as well. Those that weren't able to be with us for the uh, fellowship time, it's good to see you tonight uh, uh, as well. Please be much in prayer. Got a lot of different things going on. You may want to turn me down just a little bit, but I'm getting a little bit of a like a pop, a, a staticky pop. Testing, yeah, that's better. That's better. Uh, Aaron stayed after we stayed after church Sunday evening, and Aaron adjusted some of the uh, monitors and stuff up here and so I can hear <laughs> I can hear myself better I'm afraid that I can hear just a little bit of static so I wanted to make sure we got that right but it is good to have you those of you that are joining us via the live stream or watching later on YouTube thank you so much uh, for being with us in our service tonight as well uh, like I said we're going to be wrapping up this evening uh, the uh, standing on solid ground looking at what the biblical or the Christian view of radical environmentalism ought to be uh, and so we'll be looking at that uh, tonight, and then uh, next Wednesday night, don't forget, uh, will be our uh, Christmas fellowship meal, uh, so there will not be a service over here, it's just going to be all fellowship time, uh, just uh, uh, being able to spend time with each other uh, there for Christmas, just excited about that as well, uh, but do appreciate uh, your attendance this evening. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and then uh, we'll get right into the lesson tonight. Father, we love you, and we come to you thanking you for the privilege of fellowshipping with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and Father, also being able to fellowship around the truth of the Word of God. So Father, I pray tonight as I try to share what does the Bible say about this particular topic, that you would hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Father, help me to share these truths. Father, we've looked at what the world says, but now we're trying to understand what you say in your word. So I pray that you'd uh, use me to do that. May it encourage our hearts, give us a, a firm foundation upon which to stand. And Father, we'll just praise you for all that you do, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, as we've seen, as we've been looking at this topic of radical environmentalism, there's a lot of different topics uh, that kind of are, are different movements or different issues that kind of fall under this topic. Maybe it's a better way of saying it. And we've talked about most of these, uh, at least a little bit, uh, animal rights activism, plant rights activism, ecosystem rights, uh, food ethics, uh, land use, pollution control, uh, population control, responsible consumption and production, uh, uh, you know, around recycling and those kind of things, and then climate change especially. And like I said, we spent a whole uh, set of this series just looking at climate change because, as we've said, as far as radical environmentalism goes, this is, uh, right now anyway, climate change is the poster child. And so we spent a lot of time talking about that. And then the rest of these we've kind of looked at uh, as a group because they all have particular things in common, and that's really what we looked at last time. But we've also said, and I want to make sure that I say this because I don't want people getting the wrong idea. 
Uh, we've also said that not everybody who believes in animal rights or not everybody who's a vegetarian or whatever of these topics that we've talked about, not all of those people are radical environmentalists. Some people just care deeply about a particular issue, whether, again, animal rights, whatever, uh, uh, or you know, because of you know, uh, certain practices, they've decided to be a vegetarian or, or, or uh, even a vegan. Uh, and not everybody who does those kind of things can be considered a radical environmentalist. They just care about a particular topic and they want to you know, do all they can to help you know, in that particular area. But radical environmentalism starts with the premise, and this is how you can tell whether it's radical or not. This is kind of the starting point. Radical environmentalism starts with the premise that man is the earth's worst enemy. And you'll see people compared to cancer. You'll see people compared to a deadly virus or something along those lines. Uh, and that's a sure sign when you start seeing that kind of language or you start seeing that kind of rhetoric. That's a, that's a, that's a primary sign that we're dealing with a radical version of environmentalism, not uh, you know, just a normal run-of-the-mill somebody who cares about you know, the rainforests or something like that. Uh, we've also seen that radical environmentalism is based on an evolutionary foundation, but at the same time, there's this religious pantheism where everything is considered to be God uh, that's also a part of this whole thing. And then you add to that, and we talked about all of these last time, but then you add to that this Marxist philosophy that the only way you're going to make progress on any of these movements is to radically overthrow any existing structure because you can't work to make things better. You just have to overthrow it and start over. That comes straight out of Marxism, which is what socialism and communism is based on. And we'll talk a little bit more about that some tonight as we look at the difference between what the Bible says about environmentalism and what radical environmentalism uh, says. Uh, and, and so how do we, as Christians, take a stand on this issue and do it from a biblical perspective? Well, to begin with, we have to start with the truth that God created the earth, including the plants and the animals and, 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 and human life in particular. The Bible says in Genesis chapter number 1, starting in verse 31 down into chapter number 2, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, if you go back up to the rest of chapter number 1, that's God creating everything. So I just started with verse 31. Then starting in chapter 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So a creation worldview, as opposed to an evolutionary worldview, needs to be our starting point if we want to rightly apply the Bible to this particular topic. Now, not only does this start, starting point from a creation perspective do away with an evolutionary view, Understanding what the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 1 and Genesis chapter number 2 also helps us to overcome the pantheism that I talk about. Remember, pan just means all, and theism is, is a term for God. So pantheism is the belief that everything is God uh, and, and that you know, everything is basically equal as a result. So instead of pantheism, which says everything is God, Starting with Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and then all the other scriptures that deal with this, instead of starting out with this idea that everything is God, we start out with the, or we start out with the truth and the presupposition that everything was created by God. It's a totally different way to start out. So again, the correct view of this issue and how to address it from a biblical standpoint starts with understanding that God is the creator. Second, while everything that God created was good, we've seen that here in the scripture, man was created in a unique way. And remember, the starting point for radical environmentalism is, is that man is the earth's worst enemy. 
That's exactly the opposite of what Scripture says. Genesis chapter number 1, starting in verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So, not only was man created like everything else in the creation, but man was created very uniquely from everything else. Man was created in the image of God, and, and that's something that none of the rest of the creation can claim. And this uniqueness about man is seen in several different ways. First of all, and we see it here in this passage, only man was given dominion over the earth and all of its resources. As we talked about in the section on climate change, when we were talking about that, this idea of dominion is benevolent oversight. It's taking care or stewardship. It's not abusive. It's not unnecessarily destructive. Instead, it's stewardship and taking care of things even as we use the resources that God has provided. Second, this uniqueness of man is seen in Genesis 1.28 when God blessed mankind and his use of the earth's resources. Why is that important? Well, it takes away the idea that for man to use the resources that we find here on the earth, whether it's stuff we have to dig out of the ground, whether it's using water to irrigate a field, whatever it is, this idea of God blessing man's dominion takes away the argument that man is the earth's worst enemy and is like a virus or a cancer if we use it. Instead, what it says is we're just doing what God created us to do. Now, in, uh, even though man is sinful, now don't get me wrong, there have been a lot of people since God created man that have abused the earth's resources. As we talked about under climate change in particular, and we talked about it a little under radical environmentalism, radical environmentalists say that it's these verses of Scripture here in Genesis chapter number 1 and verse 26 through 28, that that's the root of all of the abuses. We've taken that term, dominion, literally, and we're using it in an abusive way, even though the word dominion doesn't mean that. Now again, Yes, people have abused the earth in a lot of different ways, dumping toxic waste into waterways or whatever you want to call it. But the truth of the matter is, when you look at it, the worst abuses of the environment have not come from Christians uh, as, a, as a group. Instead, they've come from the very people or the very movements that radical environmentalism is based on. That's Marxism and socialism and communism. Like I said, uh, of the gentleman that I used to work for years ago, uh, uh, he was uh, the company's liaison with China and the manufacturing arms of, uh, and chemical manufacturing there in China. And he said it was nothing, and I was talking to him about this years ago. He said it's nothing to go into a plant in China. And again, they've made some progress since then because we're talking about you know 15 years. But he said, it's nothing to go into a chemical plant in China and find empty, rotting reactors just sitting in the back of the plant site that are degrading and, and rotting and rusting into the groundwater and everything else. And it's a communist country. It's got nothing to do with Christianity. And so while some Christians have definitely abused the earth like others, as groups, it's not Christians that are doing this. It's actually the groups that are more affiliated with Marxism or socialism and communism. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a minute. So even though man is sinful now, and not you know in the Garden of Eden when God gave the command, even though man is sinful now, man is still in a position of dominion and blessing. Psalm uh, 8 verses 4 through 9 tells us this, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. There's that uniqueness that we talked about just a moment ago. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So this is centuries after the fall. 
And, and the Bible is still telling us that man has that dominion. Uh, uh, that's what all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So man's having dominion does not make us a cancer on, or, or a virus here on the earth. The other way that man is unique is that God himself became a man to redeem mankind from sin. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. So environmentalism starts out with the premise that man is the problem, man is the cancer, man is the virus. But the Bible, in a biblical view of environmentalism, starts out with the fact that man is a steward, not a cancer. And that he is uniquely suited for the, for the tasks that God has put for us to do here in the world. All right? Now, a biblical worldview also impacts our thinking about the earth itself. As I was doing some research, I came across this article, and I really like this quote. In addition to our role of caretakers, what we've been talking about with the dominion, we are to appreciate the functionality and beauty of the environment. In his incredible grace and power, God has placed on this planet everything needed to feed, clothe, and house the billions of people who have lived on it since the Garden of Eden. All the resources he has provided for our needs are renewable, and he continues to provide the sun and rain necessary to sustain and replenish those resources. And, as if this were not enough, he has also decorated the planet in glorious color and scenic beauty to appeal to our aesthetic sense and thrill our souls with wonder. There are countless varieties of flowers, exotic birds, and other lively or lovely manifestations of his grace to us. And, and we see that in just something as simple as what we did just a few moments ago. Uh, and, and that's the fact that if, if all God had been interested in when he created mankind, and I've said this in the, in my Sunday, in the Sunday school class, but if all God was interested in, uh, in creating mankind and us eating for nourishment, we could all be eating green gruel, no variety, just a single taste, or he, we might all just be eating manna which would take on different tastes depending on how you fixed it, but it was only one thing, just manna. But instead, God has given us fruits. He's given us vegetables. He's given us, and we'll talk about this here in just a moment, even animals, not just, not just for the pleasure or not just for the necessity of giving us nourishment, but he gave us taste buds so that we could actually enjoy the things that he's provided. He's given us the ability to see the wondrous things that are on the earth. He's given us the ability to... How many of you have ever heard the expression, I can smell the rain coming? How many of you have ever smelled the rain coming? <laughs> if you've ever been out on a ball field, <laughs> you know what that smells like. You know you're getting ready to get drowned. So God has given us all of the senses and all of the beauty that we have here on the earth to enjoy it as well as to use it and to function in it. So again, not only does a biblical worldview impact how we think about ourselves on the earth, but it also impacts how we look at the earth itself. Now, on, uh, getting back to this topic where it talks about clothing and feeding and everything else, on the topic of feeding the billions on the earth, many radical environmentalists actually try to use Scripture to argue that man must return to a vegetarian diet, a vegetarian diet, okay? Now, that's a problem for those who believe you shouldn't eat plants either. We talked about them last time. You know, what are you going to eat in a situation like that? You can't eat meat, you can't eat plants. You know, where's the, you know, you know what are you going to do? But vegetarians, there are some, vegans and vegetarians, and, and, and they or they claim to be Christian, and I'm not saying you can't be a vegetarian and a vegan and not be a Christian. You know, we know people who are, so that's not the issue. But there are some who will say that for us to get back to the way God intended things, we need to go back to a vegetarian diet because that's how it was in the Garden of Eden. 
all you all God said to eat was the herbs of the field, the plants, the fruit, those kind of things. Uh, and, and, and that's true. If you read Genesis chapter number 1, verses 29 and 30, it plainly tells us there in those verses that we're to eat of the fruit or the herbs or whatever, right? So that's true. But they don't go through the rest of the book of Genesis. And if they would just go over about eight chapters, you'll find out that God changed the, God changed the rules right after the flood. Uh, in Genesis chapter number 9, verse 3, we read this. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So God says in Genesis 1, eat only plants. Genesis chapter number 9, God says you can still eat the plants, but now it's okay to eat meat too. So the vegetarian, the Christian vegetarian, or even non-Christian vegetarians who try to argue that from a Christian perspective, if we're being consistent, we got to go back to a vegetarian diet. They just don't know Scripture. Or they're ignoring what Scripture says because it says plainly here that we can eat meat. All right? Now, why, though, the question becomes, and this is where people kind of get hung up on this, they'll say, well, you know, even if they know that Genesis 9 says this, and we'll show you a couple of New Testament passages in a moment, that it's okay to eat meat. If the vegetarian were to ask you, why is it okay? Why the, or why the change? Why did God say in Genesis 1, only eat plants, and now in Genesis chapter number 9, he's saying you can eat plants and meat? Why the change? Well, we can't be exactly dogmatic about it, but there's a good indication that probably the reason that there was a change, remember the flood. The, the command to eat meat happens after the flood. So it's very likely, based on that connection, that before the flood, there were plants that existed that met all of man's dietary needs. After the flood, some of those plants no longer existed. And so man needed the supplement, the plant diet, with meats in order to be as fully functioning as God wanted them to be. It's an environmental change. The whole earth was completely destroyed as part of the flood, and that included the plant life. And something in the neighborhood, I think the one number that I saw has been years ago. I meant to look this up, and I forgot. But something in the neighborhood of 90% of the plants and animals that have been on the earth are now extinct, most of which happened after the flood, if you believe the biblical account of the flood. So there were probably, I mean, even now, beans have got protein in them even though they're not a meat. So can you imagine the plants that would have been here on the earth if God said, just eat the plants? Can you imagine the kind of plants and the nutrients that were in those plants? Then after the flood, many of those plants went extinct, and God says, okay, eat plants and eat the meat because it makes up the difference or it makes up the balance of that nutritional requirement. I'm not the only person that's ever said that. Henry Morris said this years ago, and others have said the same thing. Furthermore, animals were for the first time authorized for use as food, although quite possibly this had been done before the flood without authorization. The reason for this change is not obvious. Perhaps the more rigorous environment in the New World required the animal protein in meats for man's sustenance to a degree not normally available in other foods. So he's saying the same thing here. Before the flood, there was... Everything you needed was there. After the flood, things changed. And so that's why God gave the command that we could eat meat. Now, here's the key, going back to our vegetarian or vegan friends. Permission to eat meat does not mean that it's required for people to eat meat. Okay, especially now because you can, get, you can do a lot of things to make up the balance of a lot of the nutritional requirements with other kinds of supplements or whatever. So there's definitely nothing wrong, and that's why I'm saying this very carefully, there's nothing wrong if someone chooses of their own free will to be a vegetarian or a vegan. More power to you. There ain't no way I could drive by a Burger King and, be, and, and smell that stuff coming out of the smoke tack and be a vegetarian. It's just not going to happen. If you can do that, you are a better person than I am, at least on that particular front. But, like I said, there's nothing wrong with being a vegetarian or a vegan. But those who eat meat, and this is the key, those who eat meat 
should not try to force everybody to eat meat. And those who are only vegetarian should not try to force everybody to eat a vegetable-only diet. That is not a biblical view, either side of that. Romans chapter number 14, verses 1 through 3. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, including meat. Another who is weak eateth herbs, or plants. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Now, the context here, and, I, and I'll be careful when I say this. The idea here of being weak in the faith is not saying somehow that vegeta vegetarians are somehow less capable in their thinking or anything like that. The overall context, if you look at, Revel at, at uh, uh, Romans chapter number 14 and go back to Re uh, Romans chapter 13, the overall context here is talking about eating meat offered to idols. Some believers, and it was called the shambles, you see it mentioned here in Scripture, but what happened is, is that idol, the, 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 the priests over the different idols in the different cities, like Corinth or Ephesus or whatever, there were particular meats that were offered as idols, okay, or offered as sacrifices to idols, excuse me. And, and so there were some who came to Christ, and they were like, man, I don't feel right, because what would happen is they'd use certain portions you know, for the sacrifice, and then to make money off the rest of it, they'd sell the meat in the markets. But you knew that those meats actually came from the idols, uh, the worship of the idols there in the temples. And so there were some Christians, and they would say, I don't feel right about eating that meat knowing that part of it was given to an idol. Others would say, I don't care. I didn't worship that idol. I just like hamburgers. Or, or, you know, or whatever it was. And so what Paul is saying here is, if you don't have a conscience, pro conscience problem with eating meat, go ahead. If you have a conscience problem and you don't want to eat the meat, don't eat the meat. But don't try to push off on this one and don't you push off on this one. Just do what you feel is right for you in the Lord, whatever your particular personal preference is. But here's that. Even with that context in mind, it clearly shows that eating meat is okay. It doesn't matter, you know, just the, even the context itself might be idols or idol worship. Scripture's plain here. It's okay to eat meat. Now, again, Paul even addressed this more radical view of trying to force people into particular mindsets. You shouldn't eat meat. You know, don't eat meat. Paul addressed that kind of radical mindset in 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Now the Spirit speaketh especially that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats. Isn't that interesting? That that would be one of the things that he calls out here which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So Paul says here clearly, eating meat is just fine when you recognize that it's God that blessed you with the ability to do it. Okay? So again... For any vegetarian or vegan to argue that you, as, a, as a Christian to be consistent because in the Garden of Eden they only ate vegetables, then that's all you should be able to eat. They're not looking at the rest of Scripture or they're completely ignoring it. Okay, So that's a lot of times you'll, you know, you'll hear environmentalists make that claim. That's why I jumped on that particular one. All right, Now, another key in how to biblically think about the earth and environmentalism is found in this particular quote. And this one's really important. The environmental movement is consumed with trying to preserve the planet forever, and we know that this is not God's plan. He tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, that at the end of the age, the earth and all he has created will be destroyed. For the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. Of course, he's quoting the, the, the New King James there. But then it says, The physical, natural earth in its present form with its entire universe will be consumed, and God will create a new heaven and a new earth. 
So we see that rather than trying to preserve the earth for thousands or even millions of years to come, we're to be good stewards of it for as long as it lasts. Boy, I like that. That is the greatest comment. That one little sentence right there is the greatest comment, which will be as long as it serves God's sovereign plan and purpose. So radical environmentalism at its core basically says we have to protect the earth at all costs. Biblical environmentalism says you take care of the earth until such time as God's done and his plan is complete. So again, it's a totally different way of viewing this whole topic. As for a biblical view of Marxism, and remember, Marxism is kind of at the core. You know, you have to overthrow all the existing structures because you'll never make progress otherwise. As for a biblical view of Marxism, as it, as it relates to radical environmentalism, Marxism at its core, and you have to understand this, and I think most people here probably do, but Marxism at its core is atheistic. Marx said this very plainly. The first requisite of the happiness of the people is the abolition of religion. In other words, as long as there's religion, people are going to be miserable. So Marxism, which is at the core of radical environmentalism, is by its own nature atheistic to begin with. That right there is reason by itself, just to, because the Bible says by their fruits you'll know them. So that tells us right off the bat that there's a problem with a lot of the radical environmentalism. Okay, One commentator noted this. In the Marxist model, the state becomes the provider, sustainer, protector, and lawgiver for every citizen. In short, the state is viewed as God. Christians always appeal to a higher authority, the God of the universe. And Marxist governments don't like the idea of there being any authority higher than themselves. So again, that's, uh, and we're not even getting into the Marxism, communism, socialism debate. You just have to understand Marxism at its core is atheistic, all right? Now, many radical environmentalists also, uh, and, and this is a part of Marxism, because this is a very definite Marxist idea, is that you should not have private property. Everything's owned by the state, everything's owned by the collective, and then to each his own, to each according to his ability. I mean, that's straight out of Marxism, okay? Uh, and so, according to Marxism, you should not have private property. Listen to the animal rights activists. Listen to the plant right activists. Listen to those uh, who uh, are in the support of the radical side of climate change. They will all make the statement that people should not own private property. As a matter of fact, the World Economic Forum, going back when we were talking about some of the prophecy stuff, the World Economic uh, Forum put out a video several years ago, or no, not several years ago, about a year and a half ago, put out a video that said, in the future you will own nothing and be happy. I've watched the video. All right? So there is this part of Marxism that says you shouldn't own any private property and a lot of radical environmentalism goes right along with that premise. But again, this is completely contrary to the Bible. Private property is assumed in Scripture. Otherwise, the command, thou shalt not, see, thou shalt not steal, makes no sense. How can you steal something from somebody if it's not their property? So right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, you see the acknowledgement, I guess it may be the easiest word to say, the acknowledgement of the good of private property. Same thing's true about thou shalt not covet that you face in the Tenth Commandment. Look at Exodus 20. And it was just as I was studying this that I noticed the specific here. Look at this. Exodus 20, verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. So who owns the house? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Now, I'm not going to say they own the wife, but you get the point. Thou shalt, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Don't that sound like the neighbor might own all them things? So, again, the Bible assumes private property ownership right in the very fundamentals of some of these things. 
the Bible even speaks to land itself, going back to the environmental side, to the land itself being able to be a part of somebody's private property. Four different scriptures, Deuteronomy 19.14, Deuteronomy 27.17, Proverbs 22.28, Proverbs 23.10, all talk about this. Proverbs, uh, the Deuteronomy 19.14 says this, Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark. You ever wondered where that term came from and what it meant, landmark? It's a boundary stone, especially in Old Testament times. A landmark was a boundary stone. Now we've got them little stakes in the ground with orange flags. You ever seen anybody mark those off when they're trying to determine where your property ends and where it starts? That's a landmark, okay? Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in thine inheritance, which thou shalt inherit in the land. Well, if you inherit it, doesn't that mean you own it? That the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. So the Bible clearly understands private property rights even as, it is, is, even as it's associated with land itself. The story of Ahab's theft, King Ahab's theft of Naboth's vineyard in 1 Kings 21 is another example of private property rights in Scripture. So, and then we go to Acts 5. So this is all Old Testament. Now let's jump to the New Testament because there's an argument that some make here. And so I'm going to jump on this little bandwagon for a second too. In Acts chapter number 5, we read the tragic account of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, in that passage, it is incredibly clear that Ananias and Sapphira had property that was their right to own. Now, look at this. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and, dealt and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, here's where Ananias and Sapphira messed up. It wasn't in selling the property. It wasn't even in bringing the money to the apostles. The problem was they acted like they brought all of it when they didn't. Okay, that's the lie that it's talking about here. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the, of the um, price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? So not only was the property Ananias and Sapphira's, but the money they got from it was Ananias and Sapphira's. Okay? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Of course, we know what happened there. Now, some Marxists, again, and radical environmentalists, and what's sometimes referred to as a Christian communist, which is... Uh, that, that's another argument for another day. They will actually go to Acts chapter number 2, verses 44 and 45, where it talks about them having all things common. Okay? They'll go there. And again, the context is important there in 2, 44, 45. But they'll go there and they'll say, well, the Bible teaches communism. And so Christians should have no problem being a socialist or a communist. Because the Bible teaches it right there in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. But Engels, Frederick Engels, remember we said Marx and Engels were the two guys who wrote the Communist Manifesto? They were collaborators. Engels, Frederick Engels, says this, that for, about Christians, especially Christians who claim communism is in the Bible. This is what Engels said about those Christians. These good people are not the best Christians. <laughs> now, remember, they hated religion. <laughs> he said, they're not the best Christians. Although they style themselves so, because if they were, they would know the Bible better and find that if some few passages of the Bible may be favorable to communism, the general spirit of its doctrines is nevertheless totally opposed to it. And then you got that quote, that's where it came from in parentheses. According to Engels, the Bible and Marxism are totally opposed. So for a Christian communist, to argue that the Bible teaches communism, Frederick Engels says they don't know their Bible. And a Christian who knows anything about history can also say that that same person doesn't know anything about communism either. Because they are totally opposed to each other. So ultimately, the Bible is foundationally and undoubtedly in opposition to radical environmentalism. 
Again, that doesn't mean that a Christian should abuse the environment or abuse animals or whatever. It does mean that we should not be afraid or feel guilty for using the earth in the way that God intended, whether it's the food we eat or the land we use, as long as we're doing it for God's glory and for the betterment of man and his needs. So the next question is, how, knowing all of this, how should I live? Well, the starting point on Christian environmentalism or biblical environmentalism as opposed to radical environmentalism is really found in Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. This simple verse tells us three important things. God's the creator. God has created life to be abundant. In other words, there's a fullness there that we ought to enjoy. Okay? And lastly, it includes man. We're a part of that creation. But we've been given that unique position that we talked about earlier. Now, these three truths should inform our view of environmentalism because, number one, it does not allow nature to become a god. It gives us peace that the true God is in control. And third, man's a steward, not an owner of all that God's created. And as long as we approach the earth as a stewardship, then we'll take care of it because we understand that in the end, God's the one who owns it. He owns it all. One, comment, uh, one commenter said this, what we can say is that every Christian has a responsibility to care deeply about the natural world. We must do this not only for the environment's sake, but also as a way of serving mankind. Our interactions with the environment should aim at improving human life and alleviating the sufferings of men, or men, women, and children who have been created in the image of God. Exactly how you and your family should apply this principle is something we can't possibly prescribe. That's why I said, if you choose to be a vegetarian or a vegan, bless you. If you decide to recycle everything in your house, bless you. But if you see me eating a steak, don't come over and fuss at me. And if I put a can in my trash can, oh well. We're not to how God convicts us or what we feel is a good, you know, because we care about a particular cause. Cool. Do whatever. As long as it's within the biblical, you know, range. You'll have to discover that for yourself through prayer, study, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. When you do, it's up to you to put your findings into action. In other words, and we'll talk about this in 1 Peter chapter 3, when we get to, ver to verses 15 through 17, 18, there's a difference between biblical convictions, biblical commandments, and personal preferences. And we'll talk about that. Some things are commands. You have no choice. Some things are convictions, and those can be personal. There are some Christians, and, you know, they may do a particular thing that I don't feel right doing. Going back to the meat thing, meat versus vegetables, that's a conviction. And then there's preferences. I use this illustration a lot, and, and we'll talk about it again, like I said, maybe when we get to First Peter 3. But... I'll give you a good example between a conviction and a preference. When it comes to owning a car, for Sabrina and myself, we have a conviction that says we will not buy a car that does not fit within a particular section of our budget because we want to stay as debt-free as possible. That's a conviction that God's given us, right? So that's a conviction. Your situation may be different. You might be able to, you might decide you want a bigger car than we've got. Fine. If, if that's, if that's cool. That's a, that's a personal conviction between you and God versus the personal conviction that we would have. Size of your house, whatever. That's a conviction. But you know what? God does not care a bit, and it's totally up to me as a personal preference what color that car is. He don't care. As long as I'm following the conviction about what how much to put into a car i'm in obedience to god's will whether my car is fuchsia or whether my car is white i do think there's some col colors that god probably looks at and goes hmm. 
but you get the idea. And so environmental, how we respond as Christians the environment, to the environment has a little bit of all of that. We're commanded to be good stewards. How we put that into place should be based on the convictions that God gives us. But if we choose to do above and beyond even those convictions, that's just a personal preference. They all three play out into this. But that's how we should live. So the next question is, why should we take this stand? Well, the main reason that we ought to take this stand is because it's a means or a way for us to witness. Many people are confused. And they, because of that confusion, they see nature as worthy of worship. And that we ought to view ourselves as slaves devoted to making sure the earth is taken care of. Others are atheistic or they're evolutionary in their thinking or in their outlook. And they see the earth as needing our protection from mankind's destructive tendencies. Because I've seen this quote and I tried to find out who said it. and I, can't, I couldn't find the quote I was looking for. But I have seen Leonardo DiCaprio, who's definitely an atheist, um, and, but he's got a big platform and everything else. He's basically made the statement, and I'm going to paraphrase just a little bit here because I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but he's basically made the statement, we have to take care of the earth because this is the only one we got. Well, if you're an evolution, if you're, if you're an atheist and you don't believe in God, that's a legit statement. So there are some people who are confused because they think nature should be worshipped. There are others who, think that, who do what they do because they think if we don't take care of it, we're all going to die. Still others see radical environmentalism as a means to a political end. They're looking for a way to use different causes, whatever those causes are, whether it's, ra whether it's animal rights or um, uh, radical environmentalism, just environmental issues, or BLM, or whatever it is. They use those issues, they use those movements as a way of furthering people down the path to a Marxist or a socialist or a communist way of looking at things. So there's three kind of things going on, okay? Some are just confused. S some, they're being consistent with, they think the earth is all there is. And then others are using the whole movement itself to try to get something else out of it. But the biblical view of the environment has a different message. We are to care for the environment. But it's the God of heaven and earth that's to be worshipped and obeyed. And the biblical view recognizes that there's a greater problem than environmental abuses and the fear of impending doom. That greatest problem is sin. And the same God that created earth to be used and enjoyed has provided an answer to man's sin in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we're consistent with a biblical Christian view of how to take care of the environment, it can open the door for us to witness to them about the bigger need than what's happening here on the earth. And that's why we ought to take the stand that we stand, or take the stand that we do. And that's it. Questions or comments? Questions or comments? Let me shamelessly put a few plugs in here real quick in case you want to know more about a particular topic. Um, this is called, What Would Jesus Really Eat? Uh, the Biblical Case for Eating Meat. Okay, uh, this is done from a Christian perspective. Good little book, not big at all. You can buy this, you can go, go out on Amazon, it's there. Um, and uh, it's, it's a relatively new book. Uh, but it's, it's, it is a good one on that particular topic. This one's called Prospects for Growth, a Biblical View of Population, Resources, and the Future. So this is the man's of cancer spreading all over the earth. This is the biblical view of why that's wrong and why there are plenty of resources for, the, for mankind to use. This actually is published and, and sold through the Cornwall Alliance that I've talked about before regarding climate change and environmentalism. Uh, the Calvin Beisner is actually the founder of Cornwall Alliance, and he wrote this book. Excellent book. Then... Uh, you've got this one, and I actually looked on Amazon before we started church service tonight to see. I bought this book, uh, it's called Saviors of the Earth, back in 1995, I think is when I bought the book. But It's called Saviors of the Earth, The Politics and Religion of the Environmental Movement by Mike Kaufman. Uh, I looked on Amazon. You can still get this book. 
There's a few booksellers, used booksellers that still have these. Um, average price I saw was about 11 bucks. 11 to 12 bucks. I think I paid that. Let's see how much did I pay for this book. Yeah, 11 I paid that for it when I bought it 30 years ago. <laughs> so you can still get this one. Uh, and, and the reason that I like this book, like I said, this was the book that introduced me to the whole environmental thing, okay, the envir uh, radical environmentalism. This was, like I said, back in 1995. I didn't know beans to apple butter about this stuff. But I bought this book, and it kind of started the whole thing for me as far as understanding things from a biblical perspective. It's just a good overview of environmentalism as a whole and why there's politics involved in it as much as there is care for the environment and all that. Some of the, some, obviously, some of the illustrations are going to be dated because the book's 30 years old. But the crux or the basic foundational stuff is really, really good. It's still really, really applicable. So if you're interested in this, they actually do make the, they still actually do have some of these on Amazon. Uh, the nature of environmental stewardship, understanding creation care solutions to environmental problems. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, available on um, Cornwall Alliance's website for the other book by, um, um, I'll get it right here a minute, Calvin Beisner. Uh, is at, this is actually by a guy, uh, uh, Johnny Lynn. Uh, this book, I don't make any bones about it, it's a very good book. It's a very dry book. <laughs> There's a, it, it's, it's not the easiest read, but it's still got a lot of good information in it, again, if you're, if you're really interested in digging in. Then you've got Worship Not the Creature, Animal Rights and the Bible, J.Y. Jones. Again, found on Cornwall Alliance's website. But this is specific to animal rights, where we've been talking about some of the other stuff. And then again, and this is the one that I'll tout as strongly as I can, Understanding the Times a survey of competing worldviews. This is where you learn a lot about Marxism uh, this is where, uh, and, and that kind of stuff. But these are some of the topics uh, that you find in here. Um, uh, comparing Christianity to Islam, secularism, Marxism, new, spiritual the uh, new spirituality, postmodernism, philosophy, ethics, biology, psychology, sociology, law, politics, economics, history, how to have a biblical worldview about all of those things. This is one of the best books you'll ever find uh, to help you understand a lot of what's going on behind the scenes of some of this stuff. Aaron's taken psychology. He's taken um, uh, philosophy. And we've had some of the greatest conversations <laughs> because of stuff that he's been taught in that class or the books he's had to read or whatever and comparing it to, well, what does the Bible say about this? And, and we've talked about a lot of stuff. But this is a really, really good book. I, this is one of those books, I tell you, Every Christian ought to have a copy of it if you're interested in anything around current events because it is absolutely awesome. Uh, so this is one I would definitely recommend. But that's our, uh, that's our close on this particular topic. Now, going forward, like I said, next week um, we've got uh, our fellowship meal. Um, we're in the Christmas season. I'm still praying about what to do because we've got some things kind of going on throughout the uh, uh, month. Uh, still kind of praying about, do I want to start something right while we're also mixing in a lot of holiday stuff? We may not start back up with Standing on Solid Ground until January. I'm just kind of praying about specifics right now. Um, but um, when we do pick it back up, there's three topics that I've either had brought to me or that God had burdened my heart with. One is how do we as Christians... Uh, view Israel. There are some that will take the scripture that says, you know, we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the promise to Abraham that says, I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And they basically take the approach that because of that, Israel should always be treated as hands off. Anything they do is perfectly fine. That's one view. Another view of many is what we call anti-Semitism. And there are Christians who are anti-Semites. Let's just be honest. All right? And then there is another view that basically says the Jewish people are God's chosen people, uh, that he will restore them at the right time in his prophetic plan. But that doesn't mean that everything they're doing today is kosher. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean that to be ironic. but, or <laughs> but <laughs> See, you get in trouble sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> one of the worst countries in the world to try to hinder Christian witness is Israel. 
If you're in Israel and you try to witness to people, it can be very problematic. So that obviously is a problem, and we understand it. They're Jewish, uh, and, and of course, you know, the split of Christianity from Judaism and all those kind of things. But we have to understand there is not everything that Israel does is great. So where do we draw the line? How do we as Christians, sh how should we view Israel? So we'll talk about that. Then, this is one that was actually asked about, uh, and that is how do we compare Christianity? I mean, how many of you have heard that uh, Muslims and Christians worship the same God? How many of you have heard that? A thousand times, right? Is that true? The answer is no. Why is that not true? What, is the dif what are the differences between Islam and Christianity? What are the differences between Hinduism and Christianity? What are the differences between um, uh, Buddhism and Christianity? And so we're going to look at some of the key uh, world faiths. We can't look at all of them. There's hundreds. But we can look at a few of the big ones. And we're going to spend a little bit of time saying this is what they believe about this. This is what Christians believe about this. I'm going to kind of take the format, uh, and I say kind of, not exactly, but I'm going to kind of take the format that's actually in this book. Because as I said, there's actually a um, chapter in here just on Islam. Now, they don't have Buddhism or Hinduism or any of the others, but they do have Islam. And here are some of the topics. And like I said, we're not going to deal with all of these, but theology, philosophy, ethics, biology, psychology, sociology, uh, law, uh, politics, economics, history, how do they differ in these areas? We're going to focus really on the theology, okay? Uh, but there's a whole host of different ways that there are differences and there are similarities. So we'll look at some of the major world religions and we'll compare them to Christianity and then explain why Christianity gives the better worldview, okay? So we'll do that. And then la the last one I've got, like I said, unless somebody else comes to me and says, hey, could we cover this? which I'm open for. I mean, it's totally up to y'all. The last one is going to be how do we as Christians, how do we stand in the face of persecution? We talk about, you know, IDOP Sunday. You know, we just did that a few weeks ago. Uh, every Monday we pray for a country where persecution is going on. But we're seeing the groundwork laid for a much different kind of persecution. Right now, only in certain areas are Christians being persecuted. When they come to you and they say, you can no longer own a bakery because you won't uh, make a cake for a um, same-sex wedding, and they try to shut you down and they try to put you in jail and they try to uh, destroy your business, that's persecution, no doubt. And we're seeing more and more of those kind of things. But by and large right now, we are not, as Christians as a whole, we're not facing persecution. But the groundwork for it is being laid. So we need to understand from a biblical perspective, how do we deal with persecution? And so we'll be looking at that particular topic as well. Now, when we do those three particular topics, we're probably not going to follow the same format, you know, what does the culture say? What does the Bible say? We're going to kind of take a different approach because the emphasis of the topics is different. But we will be looking at these things to try to arm people with the information they need to give a biblical view on these topics. Uh, like I said, and so we'll work our way through them. And if there is another topic, something that's you know, going on in the world that you've got questions about and you want to know how do I as a Christian deal with this, Please let me know. I am more than willing to jump on whatever topics you all got questions about. And then we'll move on after we get through with this standing on solid ground. We'll move on to the next study, okay? Questions or comments? Questions or comments? My Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again that as we study the Word of God, we truly can find the answers to the questions that we have. Father, we've looked at something that in our culture today is a hot-button issue from the climate change as the singular thing to all of the different branches of the radical environmental tree. And Father, we've seen that in each of those cases there are some key truths or, or key foundations that they're built upon. 
and that the Bible gives us the answer on how to deal with those particular starting points. Father, how we thank you once again that you don't leave us in the dark, but equip us to every good work, as it tells us in the book of Timothy. We love you. We thank you for the truth that you give us. We thank you for the witness of the Holy Spirit within us. And we ask that you would allow us to be a witness for you in the world that we find ourselves in every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're